G'day mate, 40 here. So I subscribe to the Patreon of a terrific left-wing podcast, If Books Could Kill, where these two blokes dissect various bestsellers and usually share how stupid they are. A quintessential example is the Thomas Friedman book on globalism and uh, David Brooks's book on the what, bonobos or bobos, bobos in paradise, something like that. And the premise of this particular episode that I really enjoyed from behind the paywall of If Box Could Kill was on bullshit. Right? It's named a 1986 essay that was turned into a slim 67 page book by a philosopher who died recently. And one of the co-hosts was talking about how much he enjoyed this book the first two times he read it, and then he recently listened to it back on Audible and realized how BS it was. <laughs> that this is an essay on BS, but it provides almost no examples of BS. And when it does provide an example, it's like some bloke telling Wittgenstein he feels like a dog who's just been run over and Witt- Wittgenstein says, well, how would you know what a dog feels like when it's been run over? But uh, the philosopher, okay, come at 40, I just set fire to the local care home and the police have caught me with a box of matches. Will you defend me against the matrix attacks? <laughs> no, I hope, the, I hope you, you get justice. <laughs> but I don't like defending people. Like people ask me all the time about Duvid and they ask me about this person and that person and I was like, don't ask me about people. People are complicated. And people in different situations behave very differently. So I'm not someone who really likes passing sweeping judgments on people, even though that's kind of a requirement for what I do, you know, live streaming my my views about the news. You know, you're kind of required to pass these long wide sweeping judgments about people but I, I hate it because people are so complicated so don't ask me about David <laughs> don't ask me about Rodney or Ricardo I, I'm sure there are some situations where these blokes will shine and other situations where they'll be shameful and I'd say the same thing about myself like I, I wouldn't expect anyone to stick up for me just not worth it like, if people have their minds, you know, made out, why would you want to alienate them by you know, trying to say something positive about me? In some situations I do good work, in some situations I do a lot of bad work. Just looking through my archives, pulling out some of my better blog posts, trying to improve them. There are some blog posts that just could not be improved. They were just uh, poor, just needlessly offensive, inaccurate, unfair, nasty, stupid embarrassing, idiotic. <laughs> so, anyway, the uh, If Box Could Kill dudes use this essay as a template for attacking punditry, and I think they're absolutely right on there. And they had a great summary of how punditry works, that the pundit takes one fact that he knows and adds to that you know, some other suppositions he has, and as to that, a few guesses. And whammo, bammo, he's got a column. Thinking that's how much, you know, live streaming punditry on the news works. You get a fact or two that you know, and then you pair it with some of your biases, you make some guesses, and wham, you've got a show. Now, if I've ever transcended this stupid genre, it is in the the development and articulation of certain principles that uh, enable one to better decode reality. So for example, my favorite car I've ever driven is a Corvette. I think I've only ever driven one, it was like 1986. And it was just so much fun to drive that the situation of you know, driving this Corvette, it makes one really tempted to speed. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you just tap that accelerator and the car just takes off. So the situation of being in a Corvette may very well outweigh any personality tendencies 
right? So the situation of being in church or in synagogue or in a bar or a sports stadium, right? often the situation is far more important than any personality tendencies. So that's a generalization that uh, has a great deal of applicability. Uh, also, as I walk these mean streets of Beverly Hills, if I see a poodle, right, I see a lot of poodles. Rich areas tend to have really nice, playful, friendly dogs. Right, I'm not afraid. But if, God forbid, I were to run into a Rottweiler or a pit bull, I'd be on high, high alert because 13% of dog breeds commit 56% of fatalities. So, just like you can tell a lot about a dog just by looking at what, what kind of subspecies they are, so too you can tell a lot about people by looking at what subspecies they are, right? Different groups of different gifts, different interests. And so that's another generalization that helps you to you know, unpack more of how the, the world works. Uh, if you've got a large enough group, you know, IQ is tremendous predictive ability for length of life, for law-abidingness, for willingness to cooperate, educational attainment, wealth attainment, uh, developing new inventions. Right, so IQ is probably the single most reliable predictor and explanatory variable that we have in the social sciences. So, while I'm developing this list of my favorite blog posts, I'm pulling out some of my favorite principles for understanding life. And another favorite principle of mine is uh, we weren't born yesterday, we did not evolve to be gullible. So media propaganda, academic propaganda, professional propaganda doesn't really change hearts and minds. With sufficient threat, you can force conformity, just like a parent can force a child to behave a certain way in the home. But as soon as a kid leaves the house, they almost always code switch and they start behaving as they want to. So Forty in the house around his parents when he was a kid was very different. I was totally compliant. My parents thought I was just such an easy child to raise. But as soon as I left the house, I did my own thing. Now on Friday nights in high school, I'd tell my parents I was leaving the house to go to a Bible study. But did I go to a Bible study? No. I would go to a basketball game and cover it for the Auburn Journal. And my byline would be on it, but my parents wouldn't, wouldn't pay attention. So they never once twigged to what was going on. Uh, God forbid there are a few times in my senior year of high school where I called those 976 phone numbers. And so my parents ended up getting those expensive bills on the, the phone bill. And uh, my mother asked me, oh, these bills, are they for college? I said, yes, they were for college. But I was lying. They weren't for college. So you can mold kids just like you put pressure on a rubber ball. But as soon as they get away from your direct power, they're, going, they're going to rebound to who they are, particularly around their peers. So probably peers have much more of an influence than kids than their parents do. So another generalization that helps to decode more of reality. It's interesting how the punditry game does not reward excellence and truth finding, fact finding. Uh, it rewards you know, you know, hacketry. Now, the most intelligent are the best able to <laughs> Be the most effective hacks. Like Ben Shapiro is very smart, Dennis Prager is very smart, uh, David Brooks very smart, yeah, but the, what they put out there is dumb, but they do it in a smart way so that it's particularly effective. So they get power status and audience by <laughs> making people dumber, but they give, they convey the feel of profundity while you know, relaying something that usually makes people dumber than before they picked up your stupid column. So, in this uh, essay, 1986 essay on bullshit, 
it initially has a very appealing, profound sounding inside that uh, people who purvey BS are very different from truth tellers and liars because both truth tellers and liars operate with regard to the truth. The people who are just retailing BS, they're just you know, operating in a separate category. Now that sounds really profound, but the philosopher behind it didn't bother writing any examples, so I'm not sure how useful it is. I like uh, all of the terminology and concepts that the Coding the Gurus has used. One of them is truth optimizing. Do you optimize for truth? Do you optimize for outrage? Do you optimize for influence, power, audience, money, uh, popularity? And so overwhelmingly right-wing pundits do not optimize for truth. So I think that's, that's a great insight. Uh, Colin Coward said about sports talk radio, right, the money, the audience go to the people who are interesting, not the people who tell the truth. And the same thing would go for political punditry as well. So, you know, basic commonsensical observations like uh, people often resemble dogs. You, know, you can often tell at a glance how dangerous or how friendly someone is. Uh, it's not basic truth that you can retail as a professional pundit. So every society has all sorts of basic truths that you're not allowed to say out loud if you want to have a happy life.